Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. I am your host, Sucheta Kamath, and you will continue to notice some changes with, in terms of our um, presence and uh, the way we have kind of spruced up our image. So uh, I hope you enjoy and please uh, give us some feedback. If you haven't done so, please sub- subscribe to our podcast and share, sp- spread the word and uh, please uh, tell us what you think about it. And that brings me to our conversation today with our very special guest uh, and welcome Dr. James Dankert, who is a trained uh, uh, clinical neuropsychologist from Australia before he moved to Canada to pursue his postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Melvin Goodell at London, Ontario. He was awarded a Canada Research Chair at the University of Waterloo, where he, his research explores the neural cognitive correlates of boredom and how the brain builds and updates mental models and the consequences of uh, stroke uh, for attention and vision. So it's so interesting in so many ways we are you know, interest overlaps. Um, and um, what got me interested in your work was you have co-authored a book with your colleague, Dr. Joan, John uh, D. Eastwood, and that's called Out of My Skull. Fantastic title, by the way, and a great read. So if you haven't, please do um, that. Uh, you will not be bored. That much I can promise. So thank you, Dr. Dankard, being here. I'll call you James, if that's all right. Absolutely. And it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So I ask this question of all my guests and particularly I love um, uh, cognitive or neuropsychologists because you have this understanding of brain behavior relationship and you will, uh, if you don't mind, if you, to take a minute to reflect upon uh, your own journey as a learner and a thinker. So since we talk about executive function and goal management, flexibility of thought, insight and strategic thinking, I would love to know how you were as a student and when did you become self-aware regarding what your strengths were, what your weaknesses were, and what propelled you to become a strategic thinker? Well, that's, a, that's quite a lot to ask in the first question, Sucheta, but um, uh, I, if I reflect back on my time in my undergraduate years, I, I, I'm glad the doors closed here and my two teenage sons can't hear this because I was horrible at studying. I, really? I, I was not very good at all. I, I used to, um, I can remember being on my couch with a textbook open, with the television on, with the sound down, with music playing at the same time. And so, really, um, you know, I, I was a person who, I, I hated silence. I, ne- I never liked quiet. And so I always had to have other things going on to sort of occupy my mind, occupy my senses while I was studying. And that's, of course, a horrible way to study. It's a terrible way to study. It's not good executive function uh, control at all. Um, but yeah, I, I, I did a bit of that. When did I, um, I, I mean, if I'm to address that question of when did I become a strategic thing, I've never thought of myself that way. But maybe if I just rephrase the question and say, when did I fall in love with research? And that, yes. in, in, that ties in for me, um, a lot to some mentors and people who not only guided my own learning and my own training, but showed me that research is just exciting and fun. You know? So there's a, a few. My first is um, Paul Moraf, who was my PhD supervisor. Um, and he once said to me that, you know, one of the things he was worried about was that his job research was becoming like his hobby. And I don't know why he was worried about that, because I think that's kind of a really luxurious position to be in where for my job, I get to, um, I get to satisfy my curiosity, which is in a, an amazing position to be in. Um, and then, as you mentioned, Mel Goodell, and Mel too is, you know, he's, he's quite a famous cognitive neuroscientist as far as fame goes in cognitive neuroscience. Um, but he's just a guy that uh, is always concerned about your development and, and uh, you know, your promotion in the, the field. But he also just makes it fun. You know, it was always just fun to be in the lab trying to discover new things. 
So those two guys primarily and a few other people along the way, uh, I worked with a guy called Yves Rossetti in, in France. They've all just instilled in me a couple of things that I think are important for strategic thinking, I guess. Curiosity. Yes. But be enthusiastic about it. So you don't, don't just be curious without direction. You know, guide your curiosity and, 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 and be, I guess, strategic about it. Um, but also sort of see the joy in it. The, the, see the joy in the things that you are trying to understand and see the joy in the things that you don't know. Um, and I think that's really important. I love that. It's so interesting to me. I've been talking to now more than 100 people who are experts in their fields. And one thing is emerging is most of them uh, begin to answer this question by saying, I became fully aware by, by college. And it's so interesting. We are expecting a lot of agency in our students who are between K to 12 when they're thinking about their thinking may not have yet evolved. So thank you for like taking the minute to answer that. Uh, I am tempted to ask one more question if you allow me, which is, so the, the, I love the way nobody has ever framed it this way, that curiosity will allow you to be strategic because you're intentionally pursuing something with great care. How about the flip side of it when uh, you have weaknesses in spite of having all the talent that you need. Did, did you have any tools that you developed for your weaknesses or challenges? Again, in, in answering that question, I, I'll go to other people, right? So um, I, the, the other thing that I really love about science is that it's inherently collaborative. You, you work oh, I love that. And so I work with people who fill my gaps, right? So um, I, 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 in writing the book with John, um, John, and I, I don't think he'd be offended at all by this characterization, but John is more ponderous in his thoughts than I am. I, so I'm a little bit more of a bull in a china shop and he's much more cautious. And that's a great way to combine those two styles of thinking and say, okay, we need to be, he, he would rein me in. And so, you know, you need to be more careful with your terms and your definitions. And I think that's really important. I, I, I have another colleague, um, uh, who was a, a trained neurologist but is now doing uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience work at UW. And his name is Britt Anderson. And he said that, he, he put it this way, if he, and he and I collaborate, and he said that if we dropped you and I, so, so me and Britt, in a forest uh, in the middle of nowhere, and we were allowed to choose a couple of tools to find our way home, I'd choose the machete and he'd choose the GPS. And so... <laughs> Um, so, so that's, I, I know I have weaknesses. I know that I don't, that, you know, and, and research is such a complex enterprise that I don't know that there's anybody out there that has the full suite of skills that is needed. Um, so what you need instead is to collaborate with people and it's best, I've found over the last 20 years or so, it's best to collaborate with people who complement the things I have and the things I don't. I love that. And I think that's from a miniature version of that is to develop the social skills to form allies and, and to advocate. But advocacy is through relationships. So I love that. So that brings us to the topic that you're really here for. So none of us are fans of being bored. In fact, boredom is marked by this restlessness and mild form of agitation. And that's why we all try to avoid it with a 10 foot pole, I guess. But you have dedicated your career to understand this human experience. And in fact, you write that um, true boredom uh, is precisely the state in which uh, you want to do something interesting, such as play some amazing guitar licks, but um, somehow you just can't. So tell us, maybe define it for us, uh, even though people might think, do we need a definition of boredom? Boredom, it's one of those things that everybody feels like they know, but as soon as you try and sort of put it under the microscope and, and define it more precisely, it becomes a little bit more slippery. The quote I like to start with most comes from Leo Tolstoy, and that is, he described boredom as the desire for desires. So when you're in that moment of being bored, it's a wanting state. You want something. And the conundrum of boredom, the, the problem that it poses is that you recognize that you want something to do. You want to be engaged. But at the same time, you recognize that you don't want anything that's in front of you. And the other sort of story I like to tell to highlight that conundrum is if any of you your listeners are, are parents. Most parents will know that experience of a three or four year old child coming to them and saying, I'm bored, right? What they're saying is I'm bored and I want you to fix it for me. Yes. And, they, and, and, and as a parent, we, we, we you know, trot out all the possible options for them. Why don't you go and ride your bike? Why don't you go play basketball with your brother? 
Why don't you play with your Lego? Why don't you read a book? We tell them all kinds of things and the, the options we give them are options we have watched them enjoy in the past. But what does the child do when we give all those options? Nah, don't want to. Nah, I'm not doing that. Nah, I can't be bothered. Nah, I'm not doing it. So they dismiss every single option that we provide for them. And what and what that highlights for me is that they are just representing the key conundrum of boredom. They want, but they don't want what's available. And why that is, why we don't want the current of options is a, a complex thing. It might, and it might be different and idiosyncratic to different people. Um, but for what, whatever reason, we cast our, our eyes around and we just don't see anything that we think will satisfy us. Um, and that's why it's uncomfortable because you mentioned the word agency a little while ago, right? We're expecting agency out of our young people coming into college. Boredom is a threat to your agency. It's sort of saying right now you want something but you don't want what's available. You're not being an effective agent. You're not deploying the skills and talents in anything like an effective way. So it, it didn't occur to me earlier, but is, um, is this a problem of having too many halves or does not matter? Is it a problem of having too many? Too many, like, you know, haves and have nots. Is it like we're surrounded by too many choices? Or, I mean, that's pretty arrogant to say, eh, I don't want that, I don't want that. <laughs> right. And, and so it, there could be a certain sense of choice paralysis. Uh, there's too many things. I, um, it, it's funny as an, an Australian, one of the things that happens when you first come to the United States, you, you, um, you, you go to a restaurant and, and you order something off the menu and the waitress says to you, well, do you want it with whole wheat or white bread and you have to make a decision and then they say well do you want soup or salad with that and then you have to make a decision and do you, do you want the dressing of the salad on the side or do you want it on the side and you have to make a decision and Australians are not used to that because in Australia you go to a restaurant you point to the item on the menu and it comes to you so you, you don't have a choice to ask for things right so I, I mean that's an aside but yeah choice paralysis could be a problem uh, I, I think the flip side of what you're asking there is um do people who don't have as many options, are they less likely to be bored? And we don't have any evidence to say anything much about that. It doesn't seem like there's a, a strong relationship between SES and boredom proneness um, that I know of. So it, it might seem like it's arrogant, but I think it's not, it's not that we're sort of spoiled for choice. It's that when we're looking at the things that we could do, they just don't seem like they're going to work in that moment. And, you mentioned guitar licks as well. The guitar is my go-to boredom fixer, right? So I've played guitar since I was 12 years old. I love it. I write my own songs. Um, I, I, I like them. I don't really play them anywhere, but, you know, who cares? 80% um, of the time when I'm bored, I can go to the guitar and it can fix my boredom. But that means that 20% of the time it fails, right? 20% of the time yes. I go to the guitar, I pick it up, I, t I tinkle a bit, I, I do some... I, I did some small things, but nothing really fits or works. And then I put it down and I'm more bored than I was before I picked it up. So I, that's one of the things that I think is an open research question as to why that why things work sometimes and not others. But I don't have a good answer at the moment for that. Well, that's interesting because I grew up in India. And um, if if I went to my parents saying that I'm bored, first of all, I'll get a slap. <laughs> and so there is a, some cultural restriction in uttering those words as boredom, which is, that's why I framed it as arrogance. It's, 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 it's somewhere you are, we are, you, you are claiming that you have the right to be entertained. And so I, I see that when I came to this country, that there's some sense of wa uh, wanting your emotional suffering that comes through boredom to be fixed by the world. And as if you ha have no role to play. So that's why I was framing it that way. So I wondered if you saw some research in other parts of the world but maybe it doesn't matter. It's a human condition. Well, I, I, I think it does matter what you're pointing out in terms of cultural differences. And the big difference that we would sort of make a distinction between is sort of individualist cultures of the West, of uh, you know, uh, America, Canada, Australia, um, versus collectivist cultures like India, uh, China, these other kinds of places that um, you know, have more communal attitudes to res towards responsibility, towards individual responsibility, right? Yes. Um, and so, yeah, we don't have a lot of data on that yet. We sort of accidentally, years ago, we accidentally collected an, an Amazon Turk sample that had mostly American, but it had a small group of Indian and Pakistani respondents. Now, 
the thing I would say about it, it wasn't we didn't we haven't published on it because we didn't intentionally collect it that way. Oh. Um, but what we found was that the boredom levels in general were equivalent, right? But the associations with other factors, so associations with things like self-control and self-regulation were somewhat different. Now, I, I can't say much about it because we would need to go and try and do that study properly to, to look into it. I do also know that boredom proneness has been looked at in China and in, uh, in other cultures around the world. And yeah, the, the rate of boredom proneness, so how many people report being highly boredom prone is pretty similar. Um, but what causes it and how it manifests is likely to be culturally dependent in some ways. We just don't know yet. Wow. So how does boredom look at the brain level? What do you see? Do you see less activity, more activity? Uh, I, you talk about the disconnect between two networks. Can you tell us a little bit about how it exhibits itself? Yeah, so there's not a lot of research, but we did do something a while back where we asked people to watch a movie for eight minutes. I love that. that. <laughs> it seems like whenever you tell people that's what you did, the, the first reaction is to laugh. And I don't know if it's because it's two men hanging laundry or if it just seems like it's an absurd video. It and really it is, is absurd. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit of the setup? I'm sorry I, if I interrupted you, but what did, how did you do this experiment? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to induce the mood of boredom. We're trying to make people bored and then we have them in a functional MRI scanner so we can look at the, the network of brain activity. What we did is we contrasted that with what's called a resting state scan. So people sit in the magnet for eight minutes doing nothing, essentially. They have a, 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 a point to look at on the screen, but they have no, nothing, um, no task to do. And when you do the resting state sort of scan, you, you will get activation in what's known as the default mode network. Hmm. Prominently for us, this was bilateral inferior parietal activity. This was medial um, uh, parietal and, and precuneous activity uh, and medial prefrontal activity. So we thought, well, we'll contrast that picture of the brain that people have shown for a number of decades and that they think that the default network is about self-referential thought. That's about, you see the default network when people's mind wanderers uh, um, uh, from thought to thought. You see the default network when people get nostalgic for things from the past. You see the default network where people um, imagine future events or think about past events. So when, when they're doing what we would call self-referential thought, and they also, in particular, you see the default network for what's often referred to as off-task thinking. So you're supposed mm. to be doing a task, but your mind is drifting off the task. Anyway, so we collected that, and then we looked at, the, we compared that with activity when people were watching this boring movie. And when they watched the boring movie, we got an almost identical set of acti activation in the default mode network and that's important for one reason because in the resting state there's nothing for them to do and so we expect to see the default mode in the boring state there is something for them to do there's a movie to watch now the movie was so boring and so hard to engage with that their minds just disengage from it and we see the default mode activated the other thing that we found is that when they were bored and they had that default mode activated they had down regulation of another part of the brain known as the anterior insular cortex. And this is a part of the brain that we're really only starting to put a lot of energy and effort into trying to understand. The insular cortex, as you would know, is important for interoception, those feelings of gut sensations or a racing heartbeat and that kind of thing. Also important for senses, sensations of sort of pain and disgust. But the anterior insula is a much more complex part of the brain that is part of what we call the salience network. So the insular cortex is upregulated when there's something salient in the environment for you to attend to and to respond to. Something and we, meaningful something and important. Mean, something behaviorally relevant to you. Um, and, and what we found is, is downregulated when you were bored. And there was no activity in that brain area when we were just at rest, right? So at rest- Which is you, huge, yeah. You could happily evoke the, the default network at rest and just have your mind wander. But when you were bored, you, you were sort of, it was as though you were searching and trying to engage, but you just couldn't. And there was another really interesting study from a group, um, uh, Del Mass and Whitman are the, the authors. And that, they did a really cool thing where they, they also got people bored. They did it by having them do a really boring task. We can't remember the task right now. But then they did a, a really cool thing. They asked people, how much money would you pay for a music download? after they'd made them bored or after they'd made them interested or challenged or whatever. And so the idea was that when you're bored, you're going to be much more likely to pay more money 
for the music download, just so you can just get out of that board state, right? And <clears throat> indeed, that's what they found, is that people were prepared to pay more money for the music download when they were bored. They also found that the amount of money that you were prepared to pay to get out of being bored was associated with the increased activity in the insular cortex. Oh, wow. So if you put these things together, um, and, and, and as I say, there's not a lot of research at the moment, but if you put these things together, you find that, you know, in our study, when you're bored, the insular cortex is downregulated. In their study, when they're looking at brain activity, as you're trying to get away from being bored, the insular is upregulated. So I think there's some, uh, there's an important story to be told there, but there's much more work to be done. We also have some, EEG data, and the EEG data seems to confirm something we've known about boredom for a long while. That is that when you're bored, and for people who are prone to boredom, it represents a sort of a, a, a disengaged state of attention. So you, your attention is, is not well focused. And we find that in attention tasks in EEG, we get reduced amplitude of EEG profiles that are associated with attention. So a reduced P300 and a reduced error-related error negativity. And those are both uh, event-related potentials that are associated with focused attention. So the, the picture is emerging and there's a lot more work to be done in terms of looking at what happens in the brain when we're bored. But it looks like our attention is disengaged and those systems that are important for representing things that are relevant to us are struggling to, to bring us to a state of engagement. So I have so many questions. First of all, I think uh, that your research is so cool and I... I is this, I think I've seen this video on YouTube, correct? The two men folding laundry is the same one, right? Same one. It's fascinating. First of all, there are so many questions to be asked about how did you choose these men versus their traditionally, you know, who folds the laundry, but that's another question, <laughs> but they are really boring. <laughs> uh, so one thing that comes to my mind first is uh, think about the default mode network and um, a seat of creativity that suspended free flowing of a nostalgic time travel backwards, forwards, and making connections. Sounds like in the state of boredom, uh, creativity, the, uh, because in creativity, you have not down regulation of the insular cortex, correct? So boredom is really a killer of creativity. Would you say that? Well, it's or am I getting it wrong? <laughs> no, it's interesting that you put it that way because I think a lot of people, certainly in the media, a lot of people um, uh, want to claim that boredom will make you creative, and that claim drives me nuts. Um, if boredom will not make you creative if you have developed creative outlets. So if you have honed, <clears throat> pardon me, if you've honed the skills necessary for some creative outlet, whether it's music or art or sculpture or writing or needlework i don't i don't know it doesn't matter what it is but if you've spent the years and the effort and the hours cultivating those creative skills when you're bored those those skills you've created are cultivated will be really useful in getting you out of being bored but i think so so it's not that boredom won't make you creative and i don't think boredom prevents you from being creative the key is boredom just signals that you need to do something else. You need to get out of whatever state you're in and do something more engaging. So if you have not cultivated creative outlets or other sorts of outlets to, to engage yourself, then, you know, boredom will linger and it will start to become a problem for you. My son just the other day is just is about to turn 16. He's always claimed to me that he never gets bored. So then he went for a bike ride the other day and we asked him when he came home for the bike ride, why'd you, why did you decide to go on the bike ride? He said, because I was bored. And I said to him, well, hang on, you told me you never get bored. He says, no, dad, I never get bored for long enough. I get bored and then I do something about it. And what wow, he, that's such a great observation. <laughs> what he did was he, got, he went out and did something physical. So it didn't have to be creative because he didn't want to at that point. He just wanted to go and do something physical. So it doesn't, Boredom doesn't prevent anything and it doesn't promote anything. It pushes you to, to choose an action. It pushes you to choose a way out of boredom. And you can choose maladaptive ways or you can choose adaptive ways. And I love that you uh, scientists who are talking about boredom talk about a parallel between feeling bored is so similar to feeling pain. It is literally signal, body signal to do something. It's, it's bringing attention. It's like hollering and saying, hello. Yeah. Notice this <laughs> and do something. 
And and it's so interesting. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jennifer Roberts. Uh, she is a um, actually um, professor of history and architecture from Harvard. And she did a TED talk, I think. And in that, she talked about giving students um, an assignment uh, of going to the Boston Museum and observing a, a painting and, for three hours and <laughs> studying it. Because pe- people are like, oh, I've, I'm done. Like two minutes, you watch a pa- like look at a painting and you're done. And she actually kind of, and, and she talks about um, this idea of looking at something with intent and then connecting it emotionally and finding some meaning. And she gives this example of a boy with a flying squirrel painting in, in, in that. And she talks about this. It's a cute painting. Uh, I mean, I'm calling it cute, but it's a, a American painter where the boy is leaning and he has a squirrel on a chain. Uh, or he's like captured the squirrel. But if you pay attention, she said, and she's like a professional artist, keen eye. And she said, it took me a few minutes to notice that the curvature of the ear and the curvature that that was on the curtain behind the boy and the curvature on the squirrel's ruffles were identical. Once I looked found that similarity, it immediately brought the painting in a different light. So so I think that shaping your interest by listening to the signal of boredom can be a very important art of engaging, uh, right? Absolutely. I, I think what we need to be able to do in that moment is avoid the, the negative components of boredom. Try not to be overrun by the agitation and the restlessness. Um, and then I would agree. You can, if you if you can be more reflective and more contemplative, then you can extract so much more out of what you're doing. But in the in the height of that sensation of boredom, that becomes part of the challenge to try and relax, take a breath, and focus on what matters to you and what's meaningful to you. So that brings me to this question about what's the relationship between boredom and metacognition. Because to me, it's like a, a tool to pull yourself out of the rut by recognizing your inner rut. Right. right. And, and so John, my co-author um, on the book, he's done some work looking at boredom and, and alexithymia. And so alexithymia is the challenge or the inability yes. to accurately label your emotions. Um, and unsurprisingly, perhaps, people who are highly prone to boredom are more likely to be alexithymic. They don't. Um, they, don't have, they struggle to, to label and, and, and um, you know, recognize what it is that they're feeling. So, so sorry, I, can you give our listeners an example of how that failure to label your emotion looked like? What would they, uh, what, what are they failing to do? Well, I think that the, the, what they'll be feeling is the physical components that are associated with whatever that emotional state is, whether it's sadness or anger or boredom or whatever it is, it always comes packaged with physiological changes and physiological mm. sensations. So they might be feeling those physiological sensations, but then casting about not knowing what to do about it because they don't know what it really means to them because they're failing in that metacognitive sense to sort of say, oh, I'm sad now or I'm bored or I'm whatever it is that I am. Um, so that's about as good as I can get in terms of describing that. I don't think I'm alexithymic myself, so I, I struggle to describe what it might feel like. I don't think it has ever happened to me. Um, but yeah, I, so I, there's a relationship there, potentially a, quite a complex one, that because in, in one sense, I, I don't want to give the impression that if I'm a boredom-prone person, maybe I'm not really bored and I'm just failing to label a different emotion. I don't think that's entirely the case. I think that when people are bored and prone people or just the rest of us, I think when we're bored, most of us can accurately identify that feeling in that state, right? Um, Mm. So what it might be in terms of relationship to metacognition, and it's a great question and one that I don't think we have a lot of data on. It might just be another barrier, yet another one, to responding calmly to the signal of boredom, right? If you have better metacognitive skills, you can you can start to ask questions of the state that you're in. You can say, well, what is it about this current circumstance that makes me bored? And you can start to say, you know, can I reframe the way I'm thinking or feeling? Can I, can I change how I'm approaching this? And certainly the, the um, education literature on boredom, a guy called Reinhard Peckran, who does some of this work, suggests that people who can cognitively reframe the circumstance they're in 
have less boredom in academic settings. So that that capacity to cognitively reframe, and you know, they had in, in some of their papers they looked at not just cognitive reframing, but they looked at sort of behavioral avoidance methods mm. that people would use. So the the if you contrast the two, behavioral avoidance and cognitive reframing, the cognitive reframers win every day in terms of you know uh, learning better, learning more effectively, and experiencing boredom less. So I think that's a really interesting sort of practical finding and it's true of a, a range of different things you know when we when we engage avoidance mechanisms of boredom there might be some short-term fixes that we get but in the long term it doesn't really help so two thoughts come to my mind as you're speaking about this one is always fascinates me i'm a big fan of the theater now not in a pandemic but um i and i if i'm going to get a ticket i don't mind spending the money for that one show or two shows a year but i'm going to be closer to the stage I mean, the midpoint or whatever they say, five, five rows. And I'm always fascinated to see people dozing off as soon as the play starts, you know? What I mean? <laughs> and I'm, I was like, haven't you spent a lot of money for this? Isn't this important to you? So I've always looked at it as more like a failure in self-regulation or connecting to the meaning. But you're, you, these people are failing to anticipate that they'll be bored. <laughs> right, they could, they, they, they could have- But tired. <laughs> Yeah, it could absolutely be a predictive thing. I mean, it's hard when you go to the theatre. You don't really know the motivations of everyone around you. Perhaps that person sleeping was dragged there by their partner and maybe they... I didn't think about that. That's true. <laughs> um, you know, you, you can't assume that everybody's got the same love of the theatre and the same motivations. But yeah, um, I, I'm actually fascinated by that idea that perhaps the boredom-prone people are not anticipating what things are going to feel like in the future. And when I say in the future, I mean, you know, a minute from now, 10 minutes from now. And so maybe they're, um, and this is totally speculative, but I would love to find a way to investigate it. Maybe they expect that everything they're going to do is going to be this super level of excitement. And then they do it and it's like, eh, you know. And I think that's true. Like one of the things that I think will be relevant to you and to your, to your listeners, given the, the focus on executive function. I got into this in part because of working with people who'd had traumatic brain injuries. Yes, and I love that work. I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, tell us. Well, one of the things I think is going on there, so the, the individuals that we're talking about, the kinds of brain injuries we're talking about are acceleration, deceleration injuries, concussions, car accidents, fights, these kinds of things. And they will typically affect the orbital frontal cortex, which is critical for representing reward and value, right? Yes. But what I suspect is happening for these guys, but who to a number when I, when I was still working as a clinical neuropsychologist many, many years ago now, I would ask each of my patients, and they tended to be young men, which is a common experience for most of us who've done this kind of work. When I asked them in the history taking part of the, the assessment, are you more bored now than you were before your injury? To a number, they leapt out of their seats and said yes. And they didn't just say yes, they leapt out of their seats. They were excited that somebody had bothered to ask them about this, which said to me, this is a critical part of your post-injury experience. But what it, I, I suspect is going on is because of damage to orbital frontal cortex, pre-injury, this was the threshold for engagement or the threshold for pleasure. Post-injury, this is the engagement. But now they enter into the activity that used to work at this level, and now it's not working at that level anymore. So they've got to up the ante. And you, you see all that kind of risk-taking behaviour, inappropriate social sort of behaviour that I, I think is pro probably just an attempt to bump up the stimulation levels in their brain. Now, I don't have great data on that. It's very, very hard, as you would know, to collect that data. What I'd need is some kind of measure of dopaminergic response levels pre-injury and some kind of level of dopaminergic response. And you just, how do you get that? You can't get it. Um, but, but I certainly think that there's a, a, an interesting idea to be had there that their sort of either dopaminergic reactivity or responsivity is diminished somehow post-injury. Um, and, and I'd love to be able to investigate that further. You know, and uh, just speaking about a couple of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, ideas popped in my head that one, uh, the, the research uh, with the children with ADHD shows that their ability to disengage from default mode network to task positive network, they, they tend to have uh, the, it lingers longer, so they're not able to switch and activate. And and to me, that is also another maybe sign of that, um, not boredom, but in the inability to activate the right system to engage with or, or elevate engagement by agency. 
And and second thing I was thinking about that with, um, uh, you know, I had a Tim Pitchell who uh, is another Canadian researcher talks about procrastination. And, right. and so he talks about this idea that, um, you know, don't think about uh, dealing with something, your procrastination as a time management, but rather emotion management, because we are trying to do, what we are trying to do is manage the emotions in the moment. And you just connected that, that, um, and, and to be honest with you, the work I do is a metacognitive work. It is right. not really making somebody as good as they were before their injury or, or make them efficient or effective, but recognize that you're not effective and efficient as you like. So two questions to ask of self, do you want to? And then do you have the motivation to do what it takes to become somebody else you're not? Which I don't mean to become a person, but the effort. And and I f- find that uh, the question people p- pop out of their seats about boredom, ADHD folks, they are so often find themselves getting bored and they need a lot more intense stimulation to find something exciting. And so they want excitement. They don't want mediocre. Fine. <laughs> and school can be that. Like Daniel Willingham talks about it. We cannot make school entertaining enough. <laughs> No, I, I, I absolutely agree. And there is there is data out there showing that you know kids with ADHD and even adults with symptoms of ADHD but without the diagnosis have higher levels of boredom proneness. There was a great study that came out just a couple of months ago that did a sort of an on-off medication look at, at children with ADHD, um, a fairly standard um, um, Ritalin type medication. And so when they came off medication, their ADHD symptoms rose and their boredom rose. And when they came back on medication, both things dropped in lockstep. So, yeah, I think boredom is a serious experiential challenge for people with ADHD. Um, we, we, we don't know, you know what comes first and, and is, it a, is it a response to some of the challenges of attention that they have or is it a key component of the disorder? There's a lot more to be done there, but I would agree. But, and, and the procrastination stuff, is, there's not a lot of work. There's... People who are highly boredom prone do tend to procrastinate more. Yes. But I, do, I, I, I love your insight that, um, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about this as a failure of time management or even a failure of sort of cognitive skill. We should think about it as a, as a challenge of regulation. And it can be, you know, affective regulation or yes. even just cognitive regulation. And, and what I like to tie with our, my clients is one of the best ways uh, to self-regulate when the motivation to regulate is absent is to use the world. Like we tend to do better when we are with people because they, for decency or, or to show that we are decent partners or companions or whatever it is. So if you can't self-regulate, get into co-regulation because that co-regulation can be that external motivation to not look bad or not be a less of a competent partner if you just don't care about anything else, you know? And that's how we pretty much kind of, some like the guy that in the theater who went there because he's, he loves his wife, you know? <laughs> Doesn't I, love the theater. <laughs> um, so tell us a, a little bit about this other end of the spectrum, the concept of flow. Is it a fair thing to think that opposite of boredom is state of flow? Well, it, it is and it isn't. I, I think, um, so it, it clearly is going to be the opposite of boredom in a range of different ways. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The, the way in which I'd say it's not the opposite of, of boredom is that it's not the only opposite. Right? Oh. There are many ways in which we can be engaged. There's many, many states that we can be in that we would count as effective engagement and those states don't have to be flow. And I say that because in my mind, flow represents extreme engagement. It's not, it's not just engaged, it's extremely engaged. And so for anybody who's, um, who, who doesn't know about what we mean when we talk about flow, it's that idea that you're doing something that you're so intensely focused on that time doesn't matter. That, it, it, that the rest of the world doesn't matter. You can't be distracted. No, it, it's as though the rest of the world has just fallen away and doesn't exist anymore. And it feels like, despite the fact that you're intensely engaged, it feels effortless. And it feels very positive and, 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 and you know, enjoyable to be in that sort of state. And we're using the book the, the, um, throughout that sort of last chapter where we talk about the opposites mm. of the world. We use the, the, the example of Alex Honnold. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen any of the videos of Alex, but Alex is a fairly famous free solo climber. So he climbs sheer cliffs. And, I have. and most of us would be terrified by such a thing. I mean, I've done rock climbing, outdoor rock climbing a little bit. Not, I'm not an expert at it, you know, for those people who know, in a gym, I climb at a 510 just. So they know that's not a very um, strong climber. 
But, um, you know, watching him do that, I mean, most of us look at it and think, he must be stark raving mad. You know, it's just the, 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 the sheer terror that most of us would feel. But Honold will say, I'm not, I don't do a climb if I'm scared of it. And he gets himself so over-practiced and so over-rehearsed on it that he's probably, and he, he doesn't talk about this, but he's probably in a state of flow. Um, and that's an extreme engagement that you'd want to have if you're climbing a cliff without any ropes. But I think we, we can't expect to be in that state a lot, or you know, certainly not all the time. It's a, it's an Particularly, we can have that level of expertise in every domain of our life. Right. So, so uh, you know, it, it can function as an opposite of boredom at times for some people, but I don't think it's something that we should expect it to be in. So John and I talk about other states like curiosity and interest, which clearly are opposites of boredom as well. You can't imagine a state of being interested and bored in something at the same time. <laughs> talk also a little bit about relaxation. And I, for me, I think this is the most interesting one. So John came up with the phrase of, you know, idle but not bored. So you, I love that. Yeah, so you're not, um, you're not actively pursuing a goal at that point. But your mind is occupied still with reading a trashy crime novel, which is what I do in the summer, um, or, or, or just daydreaming or fantasizing, whatever it is, your mind is occupied, but it's not, it's not directed towards any grand goal or event. And to my, to my mind, that's an important state to cultivate as well, because we need downtime. But we can't be on all the time. We can't be always pursuing goals. Um, that starts to look a little bit like mania. Um, and so, I think that, uh, and, and the reason, one of the reasons why I'm really interested in that is because I suspect that people who are highly boredom prone don't deal well with downtime. I, I don't think that they, and, and it might get back to metacognition as you're talking about it, I don't think that they recognise that they need the downtime. And certainly while they're in it, I don't think that they feel like, you know, this, this still feels like an affront to their sense as, of themselves as an effective agent. And so. I haven't pursued that yet in a research sense, but we will be soon. I think they don't enjoy it. There's no like emotional satisfaction that comes from being in that state, which to me is, uh, I will tell you that the the work um, I'm doing on myself uh, through mindfulness has really gotten me closest to that. Um, And one of the ideas there is uh, this, uh, I don't know if you've heard the term called choiceless awareness. And, it's it's a it's it's being okay to let your mind go, let your thoughts be, and simply say, "Oh, there's my mind. Oh, it's now back." So so that practice of mindfulness um, has really helped me to. Uh, but fundamentally, I'm not a person who ever gets bored because I'm deeply curious about the world, and I have so many ways, like your son, like. I don't get bored long enough and I let it go unattended. Right. I will say in a pandemic, I'm experiencing a little bit more of fatigue of my curiosity is getting a little exhausted of like running. <laughs> um, and, and that brings me to this last question. Of course, I can go on and on talking, but I'm being mindful of your time. Um, one of the things I love that you, you said that boredom can't tell you what you ought to do. Nor can we. <laughs> so well, you, you're saying um, so pay attention to those physiological signs, signs of your, what your mind might be doing during boredom, and then channel it. And the, the channeling, can you just leave our listeners with some specific things, like you just explained the leisure and curiosity, but how would that look like actionable? Like how do we put to practice? Yeah, it, it's difficult. I and mean, you know, as you would know, you know, talking about your own sort of mindfulness practicing, um, that takes effort and dedication and time to 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 cultivate mindfulness meditation and mindfulness practices in your everyday life, right? And it's boring to learn. Right. Take the time to learn it because it's literally t- teaching yourself not to do anything, which is so boring. <laughs> right. I, I, so that's one of the reasons why I don't suggest that highly boredom prone people try mindfulness right off the bat because I think you're asking them to do something that they already struggle with doing, right, which is to focus attention. Um, but so that just makes me think that the first thing to say is don't set, set appropriate expectations. Let's not ask people to be too hard on themselves. This is not an easy thing to deal with, right? I think it, boredom is not trivial. It, it is consequential. It is uncomfortable and it's difficult to deal with. And so if we just recognise that in the first instance, 
where I think that most of us for most of our lives have been dismissive of it and then turn it inwards and sort of say, well, there must be a failure about me that I'm not doing with boredom very well. Well, maybe, but maybe not. So as you mentioned, you know, I can't tell people what to do. And I, I like to say that boredom is a little bit like happiness in that way. What makes me happy is not going to necessarily make you happy. What makes me bored won't necessarily bore you. And what fixes my boredom won't necessarily fix yours. But right? I can't just tell people, you know, the guitar works 80% of the time for me. So you should do that, right? It's just not going to work. The thing to do is to first, and this gets back to your notions of metacognition too. First of all, recognize that the state has started. Recognize that you're in it, right? And then second, take a deep breath. You won't be able to deal well with boredom if you're still in the midst of the agitation and the restlessness. So when I get bored and I'm casting about, pacing about in my lounge room, my wife recognizes it before I do. She is part, in part my metacognition. She recognizes it. She sees Your external hard, drive. <laughs> external hard drive. That's right. So she, she sees that I'm getting bored and you can almost hear her say, uh-oh. And then, yeah, so, so she, you know, I, I'm casting about and I'm pacing. In that state of pacing, I'm not very effective at trying to find a way out of boredom. So calming down, taking a deep breath and relaxing is the next thing to do. And then after that is to reflect and say, okay, well, reflect on two things. One, what is it about the current situation that I find boring? And for me, most of the time, it's that I've got a 15-minute block and most of what I want to do is going to take at least half an hour. Exactly. And so... I don't want to start anything. It gets the procrastination again. I don't want to start anything because I know I've only got 15 minutes and I hate not being able to finish something. And so what am I going to do for my 15 minutes? I want to be doing, but I don't want to be doing anything that's going to take longer than 15 minutes. So if I recognize that's what's making me bored, well, just relax and say, when I get my next half hour period, I'll do it then, right? And the second thing to do, aside from sort of reflecting on what makes you bored right now, reflect on what matters to you. What what's the next most um, important thing that you need to feel like you need to get doing in your life? It, and it doesn't have to be a grand thing. So it doesn't, you know, if your answer to that question is, well, what's important to me is to, that I cure cancer, you're probably setting yourself up for failure. But, you know, so it doesn't have to be some world-beating idea. It can be something small that says, well, what matters to me is that I spend a bit more time with my children or my wife today or something it doesn't you know anything that that you can action it on you can you can do something about um that you will feel good about both the meaning to you and the fact that you're able to show yourself to be an effective agent that's the best i can do for advice that's fantastic this reminds me of james hollis's who's a psychologist his concept of mature spirituality <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of this fantastic conversation. I cannot thank you enough for being such a fabulous guest and simplifying concepts that are really hard, but so important. And particularly as there are discussions going on, how to help children return to school and how to manage this ongoingness of a pandemic. So I really appreciate your time. And that's the time. That's all the time we have. Um, here are a few things for you to think about. If you love what you're hearing, please share it with your friends. And if you have a moment, leave us a review. And finally, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. So that's all we have. Thank you again for being with uh, Full Prefrontal, Exposing the Mysteries of Executive Function. This is Sucheta. And I thank you, James, for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.